I'd like to introduce today's presenter, Gus Chikala. He founded Project Assistance in 1996 to help companies achieve better, faster, more cost-effective project-based results. Gus is a recognized portfolio and project management expert who has published many popular articles and books on the subject and is frequently asked to present and teach topics of interest around project management. Gus. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks, everybody, for being here today. Uh, we have a very full agenda. This, uh, this topic uh, probably needs about an hour and a half, so I'm going to see where I can cut some corners and uh, try to get you through all this uh, topic today. This, uh, this webinar is really a, a summary of a, a full-day workshop we do. And what it is is really a case study of the Challenger disaster um, applied to you know, the, sort of the PMBOK or, or project management theory of risk management. So we're going to go through uh, the phases, which you see here as an agenda, uh, the phases of, of risk management planning, identification, analysis planning, monitor control, and, and a wrap-up. Uh, so you know, I, I like this. I like this quote to start the topic because uh, it really brings forth um, what I call NIMBY. You know, it's uh, if you know what NIMBY means, it means not in my backyard. What what by, by what I mean by that is, you know, when you say you can't steal second base uh, and keep your your foot on first, this idea that um, you know in in the world of baseball, when we leave first base, the outcome is either safe or out. Right, and, and it's, it's true of projects, right? Our projects either succeed or fail, but that second part, nobody really wants to hear about that, right? If we go to a kickoff and we say, hey, we did a risk plan, and uh, we're going to tell you the percentage of uh, uh, what we think the success of this project is going to be, and your sponsor says, whoa, 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 wait a second. What do you mean? We may not succeed? And you could say, well, you know, 80% of projects uh, succeed, but 20 don't, or 60% succeed, or 40 don't, or whatever kind of project you run, not all projects succeed. Uh, if we say that to an executive sponsor, a common answer might be not in my backyard. I understand one out of five fails, as long as it's not mine, that's fine. So so risk management is, uh, you know, sort of a, a negative topic, right? It's, it's, the insurance industry is about things going wrong and how we recover things going wrong. So, so our context today is really to say, if we look at a sample flow of project management, this idea about how we plan for risk and how we execute a risk plan really should fit in naturally to the uh, the risk planning should fit into the natural part of the, the project management process for planning or from an execution standpoint from monitoring and controlling that we should be looking at the control activities in a project and how do we flow risk management into that, right? So so before, I, I'm going to come back to that in a minute, but let's, let's just do a quick definition. This is uh, PMI's definition uh, from the body of knowledge of, of PMBOK. Uh, I like a three-word definition, right? This is a really great uh, uh, definition, but my definition is, is very simple. Uh, threat to success, right? So that, so really, if we're thinking about what does, what does risk mean in a project context, it's, it's a question of, well, what is success and what are those threats? And really what this definition gets to is what the objectives are, right? Scope, schedule, cost, and quality. That's our definition of success, right? To, to deliver within scope, on schedule, on time, with great quality. And so risk, therefore, is the threat to that definition of success. And that's what we're going to think about as we go through these, uh, these slides for another 45 minutes. Um, so we go from project risk to the definition of risk management. How do we manage risk? Now that we know what risk is, how do we manage it? And this essentially just says it's a system of processes, right? It's a connected set of steps that we go through to identify, analyze, and respond to project risk. So uh, so that's kind of the background definition. And you know, the, the other question is, you, you know, if you think about Darwin's theory of evolution, and you were to sort of summarize that into four words, the, word, the four words are survival of the fittest. And what that says is uh, risky behavior results in, in going extinct or, or, or dying, I'll, I'll say, right? So, so we as humans or even as organisms are built to identify and manage risk. So why do we have to be so formal about that? And you know the discussion usually turns to 
We may do that in our life when we're low on gas or when our trends are low or when we leave uh, the, the, the potatoes cooking on the stove while we run out to buy some, some extra vegetables or if we're crossing the street in London and we're used to looking uh, right and the, and the cars are coming at you on the left. You know, we have this, this innate instinct as, as biological organisms to avoid the kinds of things that can kill us, right? But when we get into an organizational setting, oftentimes we leave that hat at the door. And why does that happen? You know, when you walk into a commercial airliner and you see the flight attendant and, and the pilot uh, standing in the doorway, do you ask the pilot, did you do a pre-check? Do we have enough gas? Are the tires inflated? Is there weather at our destination? You know, and, and, uh, are there terrorists on board? You know, typically we don't ask those questions because we believe somebody else is responsible, right? And even the captain may be uh, uh, delegating risk to somebody else to check the tires, to look at the fuel, et cetera. So, so it's this group think to say, well, who really is responsible for identifying and mitigating risk? And that's an important question to ask in organizations especially in organizations that oftentimes really don't want to hear about the bad things that can, can happen. Okay, so, so we're going to talk about this flow today about how we plan for risk management, meaning every project is unique, therefore the plan should be unique, how we identify our risks, how we evaluate these risks, uh, either from a qualitative or quantitative uh, uh, perspective, how we uh, develop responses, and how we monitor and control. So, um, so the one thing I'm going to do today is I'm going to run some videos, and uh, you, you get a little choppy depending on your bandwidth. Uh, you may or may not see this in full high definition fidelity, but we tested it, and it seems to work pretty well, both with the sound and the video. And this is a uh, the beginning of a documentary about um, you know we're going to talk about a lot of uh, life and death situations in terms of uh, putting humans into outer space, and this is just. Uh, the beginning of a, a documentary that talks about, you know, can we get things done if we know the cost of taking a risk can end in death? You're saying that you're going to give up four billion dollars for to avoid a one in seven chance of, of killing an astronaut. You're basically saying that an astronaut's life is worth twenty eight billion dollars. So, so that idea that a uh, you know, that an astronaut's life is worth $28 billion, what this gentleman is talking about is really the aftermath of what happened with Challenger. You know, and, and, and NASA's culture is turning into a risk intolerance that if we can't succeed, if we can't guarantee success, we do not want to do the project. And we know in the world of projects that's not a, a reasonable assumption. So against that backdrop, let's talk about what we mean by risk management planning. It says the first step, this is just a, a quote, this is not a definition. The first step is the risk management process, in the risk management process, is to acknowledge the reality of risk. Acknowledge it. Denial is a common tactic that substitutes deliberate ignorance for thoughtful planning. Nobody wants to know that they can die, so let's pretend like it can't happen. Right? So let's, let's talk about how we deal with that. Right? So, so the definition of risk management, management planning is uh, the risk management plan that results from this process describes how we're going to identify, do qualitative and quantitative analysis, response planning, monitoring and control, uh, and how we'll be structured and performed during the project life cycle. So we need to have a plan, right? One more plan. And what does that mean? Well, um, if we um, look at you know, the challenge, uh, what we find out is the longer we wait, the, the worse it gets, right? So, so as project leaders, we're challenged to deliver news, uh, the bad news early, and, and over time, bad news doesn't get better, which we can see in the graph here. So how do we, how do we really go get through this challenge of, you know, seeking pleasure early? Uh, I mean, stop the, seeking pain early as a project manager. Okay, and really when we think about a risk plan, we think about the context of a project plan. We know as project managers or working in a project management organization that, that a project plan is not a Microsoft Project Gantt chart. It's a series of plans that connect to create the project plan. What's the project charter uh, and scope management procedure? You know, what is uh, the project schedule going to look like? What is the leadership communication and reporting plan. What is the definition of the key performance indicators? And many others we could talk about, right? But the point is, our focus today is about the risk management plan. 
right? And, and, and the first step is just think about risk identification. Okay, so when we think about risk identification, the question is, what are best practices? How can we identify risk? What is, what is the methodology? What would be recommended if we Google risk management or project risk management identification? You're going to get a lot of answers. And you're really going to get a couple of answers, right? So the initial step focuses on identifying potential threats for the project success. What are the threats that are out there? The initial list. And, and, and you know, the best practice we're going to see are really two things, right? We can start from scratch with brainstorming and investigation, or we can start with a checklist. Industry best practice, if you're in an IT organization doing those kinds of projects, you could look up IT risk management checklist. If you're in um, uh, pharmaceutical development doing clinical development, you know, what are the risks in clinical development? You know, what are the adverse uh, events that can happen? How does the FDA deal with this, right? So we understand in the, depending on the kind of project we have, there are different checklists that are based on the industry work in, uh, we work in and the organization we work in, right? If we're doing brainstorming, the question is, if you're looking for trouble or if somebody were to ask you as a project manager or you're looking for trouble, the answer is, heck yes. I'm a project manager. I'm supposed to look for trouble. So if we're looking for trouble and we know that the definition of success is the schedule and the budget and the specification, we know that these are places we can go sniffing for trouble, potential trouble, things that could happen in the future. Okay, so when we do investigation, we have a target-rich environment. We know that things like the contract and the scope definition and the charter and the, uh, the customer's environment, uh, even the, uh, let's say the PMO environment, the environment we live in as project managers, how does that feel? Right, so so um, uh, you know, and how is that how is that uh, creating risks for the success of a project? Uh, there are a lot of project managers that are put into environments that are really um, uh, fraught with risks in terms of how the project is going to succeed in that kind of environment. So we have a target risk environment. If we start breaking this down a little bit, if we look at the schedule, just for example. Um, the critical path method really tells us where the risk is, right? The definition of a critical path is the, the series of tasks that are linked together that have zero days of slack. There's no margin for error, right? So we know that that's a risk. So that's one place we can focus our attention, for example, okay? Or if we go other aspects of the schedule, uh, when I do this in a workshop, I, I'll ask interactively, what are the things you might find in a schedule if you look at the work breakdown structure? What kind of things are going to come jumping off the page? And it's a pretty long list, right? If we, if we look at the, the factors that come into uh, the, you know, identifying risk, it's not hard to find things like resources don't show up on time, or if we're in a legal contract that has onerous terms and conditions, and, and maybe unrealistic deadlines with, with penalties, or technology we haven't used, or processes we haven't used, or the critical path. We talked about that, right? Optimism, awful, right? Sometimes we're asked to be optimistic. That word itself is risky, right? Uh, external dependencies, you know, on and on and on, right? So we know that these things were, are going to end up on a, on a risk identification list. Um, a checklist, right? It says, potential risk developed from previous experience. So if we know in our organization that these things about our culture, our industry, the kind of business that we're in, the kind of products we produce, we oftentimes can create a checklist. And we see an example here, uh, a risk um, list of an engine failure after takeoff. Right? What are the things, what are the things we have to do to avoid a, a crash landing? We've already had a bad event. What can we do to make this have, have, have not, uh, not be a really bad uh, outcome? So this idea of streamlining risk planning, it helps avoid overlooking the most common threats, right? And I, the idea that we don't have verbal tribal knowledge that's passed down through the generations. We have written uh, identification of how these things happen. So brainstorming, looking for trouble, going to a checklist is going to give us uh, a target-rich environment and then the question really becomes, how do we sort out those risks, right? We may have 100 risks, 150 risks, 50 risks, whatever it happens to be. Where do we go with that? 
So this, this first video I'm going to go through is really, you talk about a target-rich environment. Uh, John Glenn said it well, um, uh, one of our first astronauts in, uh, in our U.S. history. Uh, he said, uh, how does it feel to fly in a spacecraft made by 100,000 parts from the lowest bidder? Right? So this idea of what is the quality of these pieces as they come together. And so if we, you know, if we were looking at the checklist, uh, MTBS stands for mean time between failure. Right? If we know some parts are going to wear out or oxygen is going to run out or, or propulsion is not going to get us to the destination or our communication systems have limitations when it gets behind the moon or those kinds of things, uh, the reentry system, which actually was a different case study, the Columbia, where the reentry system failed. Right, where there was a breach in the leading edge of the tiles uh, to resist the heat of reentry. So there's a really target-rich environment. And I'm going to show you just a piece of this, this video. We usually run this uh, for about four minutes. I'm going to run it for about a, a minute 45, talking about how the shuttle was prepared for launch and, and, and some of the common things that we're looking for. Final inspection. I'm going to turn up the volume just a bit. The team of Copy that. In shuttle launch day, dressed in bright orange protective suits, an elite group heads to the launch pad where a space shuttle awaits liftoff. But this crew isn't made up of astronauts heading for space. It's the final inspection team. The final inspection team has seven members on it. We uh, have two photographers. We have an infrared camera operator. We have a member from safety. We have uh, two people looking with binoculars, inspecting the whole tank and taking notes on what we find. And we have a person sending photographs, images back to the firing room on a laptop computer. During a time when most workers are cleared from the launch pad, this group spends more than two hours inspecting the fully fueled vehicle. It's a beautiful sight up close. And when you're there at that moment, you only know just a very few people are allowed the privilege of being out here. The crew, the people that support the crew to get them on board, and ourselves, that's all. And so it's special. It's very personal. It's very real. The final inspection team has the crucial and potentially dangerous job of inspecting the spacecraft, external tank, and solid rocket boosters for the last time before launch. They look for any unusual ice buildup caused by the super cold propellants, earning them the nickname the Ice Team. The inspection includes looking for any debris or damage that could endanger the shuttle and the astronauts after liftoff. Using their cameras, binoculars, infrared sensors, and other equipment, team members begin their inspection at the launch pad's 255 foot level. So, so this video goes on to take you through each level uh, the 255 level is 255 uh, feet off the ground. So they have uh, several platforms and several checks. But you've heard a couple things about the solid rocket boosters and the ICE team. And those of you who uh, either remember or have, or have read history on this, um, ICE was a big factor on the Challenger disaster. So, so the, you know, this was a known risk. Um, it, it wasn't a question of is there a risk. The question was how, how big was the risk. And, you know, the, the, that day, January 26th of 1986 was a very unusual day. We'll get into that in a few minutes. But um, just sort of a background standpoint, there was a, you know, a, a fairly well-known, you know, yeah, there's 100,000 parts, but there's a couple points of potential critical failure that were really being paid attention to. So, you know, the risk analysis is a big part of this, right? So this question of how we, how we classify risk, um, you know, we got business risk, insurable risk, known risk known unknowns and unknown unknowns, right? I want to just talk about the bottom three, right? There were known risks like ice, right? And, and, and there was, it was, uh, you know, little or no uncertainty about this, right? As a matter of fact, with the tiles that doomed the Columbia, it was known that those things were falling off during launch. And one actually struck the leading edge, and they knew it. They knew something had fallen off. They thought it, they saw it hit the, the, the shuttle, um, but they didn't have the telemetry, the, the, you know, the photography, to actually evaluate what that risk was, and that's you know that, that was changed after Columbia, but there that was a known risk. Uh, known unknown, known unknowns is we have a risk, but we don't know how it's going to affect us, right? And that was really the tile, 
right? With the ice, there was some of that as well. And then the other one is the unknown unknown. So I'm going to get into that in terms of the, the, the post-accident evaluation and, and, you know, what really happened uh, uh, after that solid rocket, rocket booster exploded and those pieces were falling out of, out of the sky, you know, there's, we'll, we'll do a quick analysis, uh, a, a calculation of risk and, and figure out could anybody have anticipated that or here's a question I like to ask. What's the definition of an issue or risk that happened? Is every issue preceded by a risk? When I ask that question, the common answer is yes. When I ask a clarifying question, was every issue preceded by a known risk? Because most people will say no, not every issue was preceded by a risk. If I say, hold on a second, was every issue preceded by a known risk? And the answer is no. Then I go back and say, is every issue preceded by a risk? And the answer is yes. The question is, did we know about that risk? Right. So that's a that's you know they're they're unfortunate risks. They're hard to explain. They do happen in real projects. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about qualitative versus quantitative risk. And, you know, most projects do not do a qualitative risk analysis like you would see uh, with an insurance actuarial that can tell you exactly how many 16-year-olds and what the percentage is to be in a fatal accident before they turn their 17th birthday. I mean, we have real stats like that out there. So this is about collaboration. That's what Meg uh, Wheatley's talking about. You know, even in a top-down militaristic uh, situation, we still have to engage everybody. The people who know the risk the most are the ones on the front line. And we're going to see that and how that worked with thiocol propulsion. And, and Roger Bougelet, who was the engineer uh, that, su that suggested that that launch not go, uh, go on, on on that fateful day. Okay, so, so, you know, the process of assigning relative degrees of likelihood and impact to each risk. So the, the idea that we're going to get uh, specific measurements of likelihood and impact to figure out what a risk is or what risks are going to be uh, dealt with, okay? So, so the real question is, are all risks created equal? And the answer is no, right? And, and, and so this, this idea of analysis is how do we separate the risk we can live with, literally live with, or the risks that have to be mitigated, right? And so we get into this function between likelihood and impact. What are the odds? And what, and what are the actual severity or impact of that risk? And it's the combination of likelihood and impact that we want to look, like, look at. And, you know, this is a, this is a really tricky thing to do. Um, when we talk about uh, really this idea of qualitative versus quantitative, qualitative is really about degrees or comparisons, right? It's not a mathematical equation. It's a comparison. So, like, I, you know, I like to use this example of um, high probability versus, or low probability, high impact. These are risks in our lives that are there every day, that uh, they're in our projects, they're in our daily life. Um, you know, what's the odds of a meteor hitting the Earth and uh, stopping your project? I mean, the reality is you can calculate that. You can call it a high, pro a high impact, but a, but a low probability, right? So, so these combinations get pretty tricky on us, right? Uh, you know, how do we deal with, uh, you know, something that we don't think is going to happen and then it happens anyway? These are my least favorite risks because they do happen. They're rarely mitigated. If they're low probability and high impact, they are sometimes. We have uh, disaster recovery for data centers. We have uh, some things in our lives that, that are uh, prepared, you know, tornado shelters and airports, those kinds of things. But uh, there's a, I could I could cite many 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 uh, high impact low probability a uh, coronal mass ejection from the sun uh, expected to happen every 150 years. Look up the Carrington event of 1859. We are overdue for a coronal mass ejection, but most people aren't preparing for that. Um, our, the U.S. defense uh, forces have prepared, but the, the average citizen doesn't do this, right? So. You know, will you know? Will uh, a meteor uh, strike your 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 project and, and make it go bad? Well, let's let's see what uh, NBC News has to say about this. The meteor that rocketed into Russia really got our attention a few weeks back. We learned today about the threat of such things to our modern world. In the meteor and asteroid tracking business, they call the big ones city killers. And while there was very little good news today about our chances of getting them before they get us, 
there was some talk about future remedies. Our report tonight from NBC's Stephanie Goss. Last month, the meteor rocketed into the atmosphere and exploded over Russia, frightening because the shockwave blew out windows and injured 1,200 people. It came out of the sun. It came from a direction where our telescopes could not look. Today at a hearing on Capitol Hill, leading space scientists told lawmakers the U.S. is not prepared to defend itself against meteors of the same size. If you detected uh, even a small one, uh, like the one that uh, that they did in, in Russia, um, headed for New York City in three weeks. What would we do? The answer to you is if it's coming in three weeks, uh, pray. Scientists say they have identified all asteroids large enough to wipe out the planet, like the one suspected of killing off the dinosaurs, and there is no immediate risk. The concern is meteors that are smaller, but still big enough to take out a city. The number of undetected potential city killers is, uh, is very large. It's in the range of uh, 10,000 or more. The probability of impact is low, they say, but at present funding levels, NASA believes it will take almost 20 years to identify them all. What would help is an infrared telescope. The government won't pay for one, but a former astronaut is looking to build the first ever privately funded deep space telescope. NASA is collaborating on the project, but the space agency says it still needs more money to identify and develop ways to protect the planet. A good segment of the population thinks it's just a matter called Bruce Willison, you know, and, and you know, notwithstanding we don't have a shuttle anymore. Perfect. Hollywood's version is definitely a bit dramatic, but scientists say there is reason to be concerned. The meteor in Russia was like a shot across the bow. Stephanie Goss, NBC News, New York. So this, you know, this idea of you know, what, what can we afford to, to, to do to mitigate these risks, right? That, that becomes a factor. We can say it's high impact, low probability. Uh, you know, my, my, my rule of thumb on that is if, it, if it's an inexpensive uh, mitigation, do it, right? If you've got a high, high impact, low probability, and all you've got to do is, you know, keep three days of water in your basement, and that costs you 15 minutes on a Saturday afternoon, Get, get three days of water in your basement. I mean, it's a simple example of that, but, uh, you know, you can go to the FEMA's home page and uh, see how, how they suggest you prepare uh, to be alone for a while if something happens, right? So, so that's just a, sort of a, a human uh, life kind of example. But if we get in back into projects, uh, I put this, uh, my, what I call my mascot of qualitative analysis is, is Goldilocks, right? I mean, this idea of putting factors to consider on risk impact and risk likelihood from a qualitative standpoint, oftentimes we see just something simple like high, medium, and low. Or in Goldilocks, it was too hard, too soft, just right. Or too hot, too cold, just right. Or too big, too small, just right. You know, so how do we figure out those, those comparisons without doing a quantitative, uh, actuarial, mathematical analysis of real statistics? Right, so a lot of times we'll see things like combinations, right? What's the high, medium, low impact and what's the high, medium, low likelihood? What I see sometimes is even putting a factor on this, right? Let's say high is three and medium is two and, and low is one and, and, and factor these things together, multiply them, and see what kind of scores we come up with. So we may see some high impact, high probability that we're going to go try to mitigate, but what about high impact, high probability, and high cost? Right? So sometimes even a high-high combination does not get the proper treatment. And that's just, you know, that is where we as project managers become insurance salespeople. Right? How do we sell insurance on a risk that may never happen? Insurance uh, is not something people want to buy. Uh, we don't like paying for insurance and, and not uh, getting any benefit from it. And, you know, there's really no any... Uh, no good outcomes from insurance, right? If I don't buy it and I don't need it, that's really not smart. Like, you know, I may not need it, so let's not buy it. Uh, I may not need it and uh, nothing happens. Okay, that's cool. Uh, not a good idea, though. It's kind of foolish thinking. Uh, I'm not going to buy insurance and something does happen. Well, that's really bad, right? I do buy insurance and something happens. Yay, my basement has flooded, so I get to have a claim. That's not fun. Um, I buy insurance and I don't need it. 
Um, maybe we prefer that, but that's not fun either, right? So, so it's really just it's a tough conversation is the point, right? So uh, just a little bit on quantitative risk analysis. How do we actually measure these things if we wanted to? What if we are an insurance company? Uh, how, how do we look at this, right? So the, the, the methods are really degrees of likelihood, which is percentage, right? Statistical uh, history of how many events happen, and that impact usually is measured by dollars, right? So we can, we can use an example of if, if the loss of a key resource is $10,000, and we're going to spread that across four projects, each project kicks in $2,500, and that's kind of how insurance works, right? We, we, uh, we spread that additional budget into the project. Okay, so, so you know, there was a decision made on January 26, uh, 28, 1986, to launch the space shuttle despite the admonitions of the, the folks closest to the risk, uh, saying we shouldn't do this. As a matter of fact, um, when you say, you know, when you think about the customer, well, to say who was the customer? Well, you know, if you ask who's the customer of the space shuttle, there's a lot of answers. It's the U.S. public. We're paying for it with our tax dollars. There's supposed to be a benefit from that. How about the payload that was on there that day? Uh, in this case, uh, the mission was called Teacher in Space. The payload was literally Krista McCullough, right? Bringing, uh, there were other science uh, projects there, but the, the, the mission was named after Teacher in Space. And it's interesting if you think about that, right? Ronald Reagan was asked a lot of questions by, by the press to try to paint him into a corner. They called him the Teflon president. And, and one clever uh, reporter asked him, Mr. President, how could you expect to be a Hollywood actor and be the president of the United States. Ronald Reagan was a, a Hollywood actor, if you don't know that, before he was governor of California. Um, his answer was, how can you not be a Hollywood actor and be the president of the United States? And he was. I mean, he was on stage and he put on quite a show. And, you know, if, if you were to, uh, to, to net out what, what, what Reagan was into, I could ask this question. Finish this statement. It was a, a really famous part of Reagan's policy. Mr. Gorbachev tear down that wall, right? And, and that's what he intended to do. And, and literally, this project, this NASA project, this, this propaganda of, of Crystal McCullough going in space and doing second grade mathematics uh, while, while flying a spacecraft above the Soviet Union was really, was really propaganda for a project that literally was named after Hollywood. It was called Star Wars. Right, it was called the uh, SDI, the Strategic De Defense Initiative. And, and I bring this up because that was the pressure from the White House. I'd like to ask this question. What is a constitutionally mandated occurrence that happens every January in the United States that the president does? And not the inauguration. That's coming up uh, in a couple weeks. But shortly after that, it's nationally televised, and it's the State of the Union. And that was coming on. Uh, a couple nights later, right? So the press, so, so literally, the White House said we need to launch this thing because Ronald Reagan was going to get on that that uh, State of the Union and and announce that Krista McAuliffe was flying above space, and it was really a message to the Kremlin to say we have the capability to wipe you out. We have the technology. We can put a teacher in blue jeans over the planet. And uh, doing mathematics, and, and you know, you've got people in line to get toilet paper, right? And so it was a real contrast he was trying to make, and that was the pressure. And Roger Bujalai, who's the engineer who said we shouldn't do this, is going to talk about this right now. These huge rockets are made up of four motor segments fitted with solid fuel, designed to be reused after each launch. The joints between each segment have to withstand the vast forces produced during blast-off. Each segment is sealed against the next segment with two rubber seals, called O-rings. For the rocket boosters to work, the joints have to function perfectly. Part of Roger Beaujolais' job is to make sure they do. Three days after mission STS-51C lands, Beaujolais starts his inspection of the joints on the return rocket booster segment. Even 20 years later, the surprise at what he found that day 
is still vivid in his mind. I went around and on the first booster I found a lot of the joints. Hot gas, massive amount of hot gas for propulsion had actually compromised the primary odor. So I thought, my God, we came in about eight or ten seconds of failure. When the rocket booster sections are slotted together, the joint is sealed by two O-rings. The O-rings are designed to form a seal against the superheated gases that are produced at incredible pressure during launch. The first O-ring should do the job. The second O-ring is a safety backup. Ozelay's photos of Flight 51C's joints reveal hard evidence there is a major design flaw. He discovers that hot gas has blasted past the first ring and burned the second backup O-ring. I instantly... Sorry about that. In my mind, thought, oh, this has to be caused by cold weather to proceed this launch. Beaujolais immediately hones in on one thing that made Flight 51C different. The temperature. Post-flight analysis showed the O-rings were 53 degrees Fahrenheit, unusually cold for a launch. The O-rings are supposed to be flexible. On launch, they squeeze and stretch to seal the gap. But on Flight 51C, the dual O-ring system malfunctioned. The primary seal did not work. Hot gas escaped. Luckily, the second O-ring caught the leak. If it hadn't, the result might have been far more dangerous. The next day, Beaujolais reports his findings to NASA. Together, NASA and Morton Firecall conclude that the condition is not desirable, but acceptable. Shuttle launches continue. But Beaujolais and his colleagues run further tests. The results are shocking. To their surprise, they discover that the O-rings could also be ineffective, even at room temperature. Beaujolais takes his findings to his boss. When we went to our manager, who was my boss, and told him about this, he said this material was too sensitive to release to anybody, so he kept it secret. That was, that was really tough for Roger to go through. As a matter of fact, Roger made a career in uh, public speaking about ethics in a corporate environment. So there were billions of dollars on the table. There was the White House pressure. There was, um, you know, a bad, uh, just, just a, you know, a bad situation and um, obviously uh, a bad mistake. So we're, we're going to talk a little bit about um, some of the stats behind that in a moment. But let's talk about risk response planning. What would, what would we do if we thought this was going to be a problem? How, how can we mitigate this risk, right? So, so really this is, uh, it, it's an interesting definition here. I underline these words because it, it, it gets to the essence of how hard it is to sell this insurance, right? To, for risk response planning, it must be appropriate to the severity of the, severity of the risk, cost-effective in meeting the challenge, timely to be successful, realistic within the project context, agreed upon by all parties, and owned by a responsible person. Ooh, that's a mouthful. I'm out of breath just reading that, right? So this is difficult to do. It's difficult. It's not so hard to identify risk, it's not so hard to analyze risk, it's really hard to get an organization to respond to it, right? So, so how do we select risk and, you know, how do we decide what the action is going to be and, and, and what's the cost going to be and how do we sell this, right? How do we select and get this thing in place? And, you know, there's oftentimes we see acceptance of risk, we see avoiding the risk, we see transferring the risk. But ultimately, we got to figure out how we might reduce or mitigate the risk, right? So there's all these other responses which says sweep it under the rug or give it to somebody else, right? So when we really get into response planning, um, it's really about mitigation versus contingency, right? The typical responses are, can we spend money up front to prevent the risk or are we going to wait till it happens and then try to do something about it, right? We can have... Um, a fire extinguisher if the fire happens and try to have a contingency plan uh, to, to, to limit the damage once it occurs. 
or we could do something to say, how can we prevent a fire from even happening? Right? So it's that idea that, that we have different ways we can respond to a risk. And, and really, I'm going to go down just one more path on this thing. If, if you know, the Challenger story was a question of really a series of risks, that's the other thing, right? How do we look at the, uh, uh, the combined effects of risk, right? If, if we said something was going to happen one in a hundred times, but there's, it has to be a series. So I'll give you an example. What are the odds of an explosion during launch? Let's say that's one in a hundred. And what are the odds of an explosion during launch and happening in low Earth orbit, right? We could have an explosion, but we may already have jettisoned the, uh, the solid rocket boosters, right? What are the odds of having an explosion during the launch and low Earth, low Earth, uh, low Earth orbit and, and an intact crew cabin separation from the, from the uh, orbiter? What are the odds of, let's say that's one in a hundred. What are the odds, uh, even if the crew, set, uh, uh, crew uh, cabin separates, What's the odds that there is somebody still alive, right? And if we said, what are the what are the odds of all four of these happening at the same time? It's a pretty big equation, right? Uh, we, we we if we multiply all these things together, we get a one in a hundred thousand chance. Now those kinds of of probabilities oftentimes are not mitigated, right? It was that first video, you know, can we spend twenty eight billion dollars to save an astronaut's life or to prevent or guarantee that that an astronaut will not uh, lose life in a launch, uh, it's not going to happen, right? So this next video is a post-analysis uh, video that was done on the 25th anniversary of the Challenger disaster. The night before the launch, Beaujolais repeated his warning. But with the previous shuttle having just set a record for delays, NASA's leaders were impatient. Beaujolais' bosses told NASA the O-ring evidence in the memo was inconclusive. Challenger's launch was ordered. A puff of black smoke at liftoff was the ominous sign that Beaujolais was right. The O-rings had already failed. The smoke appeared when they burned. After a few seconds, the jet of flame appeared. A post-accident report by NASA described it with passionless precision. The plume is seen here impinging directly onto the surface of the external tank and the lower aft strut at 60.248 seconds. The sideways flame burned like a welder's torch through the gap left by the blown O-rings. It pierced the giant orange fuel tank and fuel began streaming out. Still, no one knew anything was wrong, not until Challenger, its astronauts, and its teacher in space had flown for 73 seconds. At 73.191 seconds, a flash was observed between the ET and orbiter that was immediately followed by the start of total vehicle breakup at 73.213 seconds. During the next 100 milliseconds, additional flashes occur in the SRB forward attach area. As the ET broke up, the released fluids vaporized rapidly, producing an expanding cloud of gases, vapors, and cryogenic fluid with embedded debris and localized combustion of mixed gases. No shock wave or other evidence of a violent explosion was detected in the imagery. Illumination from a combination of SRB plume radiance, reflected sunlight, and peripheral burning of gases gives the cloud the appearance of a fireball. By 73.6 seconds, the main engines were in automatic shutdown mode as a result of reduced propellant pressures. The last telemetry from Challenger was received 73.618 seconds after launch. The actual vehicle breakup was essentially obscured from view by the vapor cloud, which abruptly enveloped the vehicle. Hundreds of fragments were noted exiting the ET cloud. Those identified included the shuttle main engines, the left wing, crew cabin, and both SRBs. What was happening to the crew at this moment? They were still alive. Challenge is fast. Launch is fast. It's bang. And then it's a two-minute ride down. And you're conscious, we know that. Astronaut Story Musgrave told me the crew survived in that white cloud. It was Challenger's fuel tank that exploded. The shuttle itself just broke apart. The crew compartment with its seven living occupants was intact. The initial path of the crew cabin from the vapor cloud carried it across the path of an adjacent contrail, clearly revealing its truncated form and attitude. The left wing became visible at 78.531 seconds. The main engines, and crew cabin are also identifiable. It took two minutes and 45 seconds for the crew cabin to hit the water. 
the impact speed was 207 miles an hour. A NASA statement released after the accident reads, the forces to which the crew were exposed during orbiter breakup were probably not sufficient to cause death or serious injury. And later, NASA is unable to determine positively the cause of death of the Challenger astronauts, but has established that it is possible but not certain that the loss of consciousness did occur in the seconds following the orbiter breakup. Musgrave, who is a medical doctor and surgeon, is quite certain. In fact, when you hit the water, you know that? I think so. That's always been controversial. I don't really know, sir. Is that controversial? No. It's hard evidence. Yeah, you died when you hit the water. At the bottom of the ocean, investigators found that some of the crew's emergency oxygen masks had been turned on. Said another astronaut, Scobie fought for any and every edge to survive. He flew that ship without wings all the way down. They were alive. You could have lost consciousness at that altitude if it depressurized for a little while. But then, you know, there's all kinds of evidence that you died when you hit the water. Yeah, so when, when we do this in, uh, in a workshop setting, you know, one of the things, one of the questions we ask is, what would you change next time, right? So, so what, was, what was the retrofit? How did you mitigate that risk that we know that that could happen again? And, uh, and the answer was uh, an actually escape system. You, you couldn't use an ejection seat uh, because there is a lot of it. You, you, they don't, they're not like an F-15 where it's just a glass canopy that you have to blow off to, to eject. There's a significant uh, structure around these astronauts, so it was an it was a basically a, an exit system. You blow a hatch, you go down a pole, and uh, and you pull a parachute. And these things were designed um, to go a couple thousand miles an hour before they could uh, uh, they could still jump out if they were going a couple thousand miles an hour. So that they, they, that may have saved them, but um, you know they had se uh, each ox uh, astronaut had seven auxiliary oxygen. Uh, units in their seat that were act activated in an emergency, and four of the seven uh, were found to have uh, been activated when they pulled the uh, wreckage up from the bottom of the ocean. So that's why story of Musgrave says, uh, A, they were alive, and B, uh, you, you died when you hit the water. So, so risk monitoring and control is, is, is uh, really what the essence of this is, right? Anybody can plan for risk, anybody could, you know, uh, analyze risk, and maybe even put plans in place, but the, the bottom line is, are we staying on top of it, right? It's part of our project monitoring, as part of our execution, as part of our cadence and keeping up with the project, this is part of what we need to do, right? So, so you know, this quote here from uh, uh, the Harvard Review of, of a famous uh, Chinese general uh, is, is, is really about, this is saying it's not about planning, it's about execution, right? So, so you know, monitoring is about implementing the plan, tracking it, uh, looking at residual risk. If I put a risk management plan in place, sometimes I trigger new risk. I, I put a parachute on you, is it going to open? Does the hatch blow? Can I pluck you out of the ocean uh, in um, uh, unfriendly waters, right? So there's all this other stuff we have to think about as we go through this process. So, you know, when we get into this, this uh, preparing for risk monitoring, it's about how we integrate it into our tracking and analysis of the project plan, right? So we have to monitor these things on a regular basis. Um, our plans change over time, and we have to monitor not only the risks themselves, but what about the, the, the scores, right? What is their impact? What is the probability? Those profiles change over time as well, right? So we need to keep continually update the plan. You know, using our risk tools, how do we bring this into our natural evaluation of the project progress, right? So um, this is a uh, this is a video I'm not going to show um, because we're running out of time. This is an F-15 uh, pilot who did eject, and it talking it shows the residual risk when he was in the cold water and. His, his leg was kind of hanging off and, and how they saved him anyway, but the point was just ejecting is not enough, right? So, so the risk management flow is really this idea of how do we plan for risk management, how do we identify risks, how do we perform qualitative or, or, or quantitative, most projects do uh, qualitative, but you can do, you know, you can, you can collect data 
on real projects and find out what the quantitative uh, occurrences are of uh, something simple like we see all the time on projects, resources don't show up on time and, and cause a delay of the start of the project. We can count how many projects in our organization have done that in the past two years, three years, five years, and actually get a statistical probability of how many projects are not going to start on time due to the lack of resources being available, or critical resources being available is the most common one. So, so those things can be done. Impact, can we measure the impact of, of something going wrong? Yeah, of course we can. When we get into the, uh, the workshop hands-on, uh, we, we get into some examples of uh, some ways we can come up with uh, even ranges, right? Uh, even if we do high, medium, and low, what do we mean by high impact? What does that mean from a dollar standpoint? Is it more than 50000 Is it more than 100000 Is it more than three times the budget of the project? So it's those kinds of things we can get into, right? When we look at that initial video where the gentleman, uh, uh, the moderator of, of the uh, documentary, was talking about $28 billion being the, uh, the quantitative uh, number that it would take to, uh, or, or the impact uh, of trying to mitigate that risk. Uh, so planning risk responses and then obviously monitoring and controlling. So um, as I mentioned before, you know, we do this as a, uh, as a, as a program, right? Uh, practical approaches to identifying, evaluating, and mitigating risk is uh, something that, you know, you can find this on our website. I'm not going to go into any depth on this. But uh, we, uh, we have a brochure out there if you're interested in uh, doing this with your actual project teams. Uh, as, we, as we're going to get to Q&A uh, in about a minute. So before we get there, uh, our mission, Project Assistance, is uh, to deliver the future into the present. That, you know, the idea that projects, in fact, deliver missions. They deliver um, uh, the vision of the organization, and projects are the vehicle that deliver that vision, that future, right? So we really have primarily two sides of that, right? We talk about being better, faster, more, more cost-effective projects for our customers through two ways, right? PMO structure, definition, and implementation, and then project leadership and execution, which is really this first bullet here, right? Our offerings are primarily we staff projects with project managers, BAs, program managers, coordinators, schedulers, portfolio managers, uh, and then, you know, from the structure point, we, we help PMOs uh, build their vision and roadmap to be successful, uh, work with the methodologies and the processes, uh, including the change management and adoption processes to change the culture. Uh, we're a Microsoft partner. Uh, we've been project experts. I uh, started this company in 96 with a product called Project Commander. So we've been on this topic for a long time. Um, uh, my book on Project uh, Microsoft Project is one of the popular ones out there. Uh, this became a university text in 2016. And uh, our education is around risk management, leadership, uh, Microsoft Project, project management theory, uh, requirements management. So there's all that stuff's out there on our website. Uh, just a quick sampling of uh, some of the customers we've dealt with in the past. But to give you uh, at least two or three minutes to see if we have any questions here, uh, I know I went pretty fast. Uh, we covered a lot of stuff. Um, so we're actually uh, through 60 slides. Uh, we do uh, have a number of open requirements for project management positions. So if you want to work for an organization that eats, drinks, and sleeps project management 24-7, uh, please send uh, an email to Kayla Marquette, uh, who's on our recruiting team. So uh, our next webinar on March 1st is about staffing. Uh, you know, PMPs are great, but how do we really get real leaders? Uh, meaning, how do we take the functional skills uh, that a PMP tests for and actually prove that we can apply them, right? So we talk about finding the right staffing partners to blow up for excellent uh, project leaders. That will be on March 1st. You'll see a mass email go out probably sometime next week, Dan, for the invitation to the March 1st event. Uh, no, there will be a follow-up within 24 hours of this to the attendees because we have uh, several uh, things to get out to you, including um, a coupon for the book, uh, just, just as a thank you for attending, uh, a PDF download of the slides, a video link to uh, a, a video of what we covered here today, um, 
and as well as an invitation to this next webinar. So you should be getting that uh, by the end of tomorrow. Thanks, Dan. I appreciate that. Um, so question and answer. So there's a question uh, console. If anybody has questions, uh, feel feel free. Uh, have we had any questions submitted yet, Dan? Uh, we do. Oh yes, we just had one come in. Um, are there any tools you use for this risk management process? Uh, yes, yes. So um, we have a spreadsheet. Uh, as a matter of fact, why don't we add that to the list of things we send out? Um, we have a um, risk management tool that really follows the process that we talked about today. Uh, the one we have is a sample of an IT. Uh, from an identification standpoint, it it's kind of has an IT flavor, but uh, it also has a general flavor, right? Like you might say it's IT because it talks about uh, maybe something about the system design or the integration testing, but it also has uh, probably 90% of it applies to any kind of a project, like the risk of uh, unengaged uh, stakeholders or uh, subcontractors who don't have the skills or they're going to leave or, or, or where the technology is new to us. So um, it is a spreadsheet that has the identification, has uh, automatic scoring if you hit high, medium, low. Actually, we have more, more than that. We have, uh, I think, uh, five degradations of, uh, or gradations, I should say, grades of impact and probability. So we can, uh, yes, we have a tool, and we will share that with you. Are there any other questions? Uh, that's a good question. That's all the questions we have at this time, so thank you so much for joining us, and uh, we look forward to being in touch with you. Thank you.